Welcome, everyone. Today is March 15th. I'm Brady Volp. This is episode 46 of Get Your Tech On, all th- our show on all things Docsis. We've got a great show today and several guests with us. First up is John Downey. So, hey, John, it's good to have you back with us. You're, uh, we know you're CMTS technical leader at Cisco Systems. So uh, anything new going on with you, John? Uh, same Docsis 3.1, Remote Fi. You know, FDX is still there, but you don't hear a lot of hoopla right now since Expo in October. But, uh, I mean, there's still talk about FDX and moving forward. Um, happy Ides of March Day or post-pi, post-Pi Day. Yeah, we missed Pi Day <laughs> yesterday. That's right. So, all right, John, good to have you back with us. You're, uh, I know you're broadcasting out of uh, North Carolina, right? Correct. In the middle of the woods. All right. Uh, next up is uh, Larry Wilcott. Uh, Larry is with us, uh, broadcasting out of Denver. Larry's uh, Comtax, Comcast Next Generation Technology Group. He is also SCTE Member of the Year. Larry, thanks for joining us. What's going on with you, Larry? Hey, Brady. I'm glad to be here. This is always one of my favorite things to do and my favorite people to do it with. <clears throat> so I appreciate the invitation. It's been, uh, you know, just a crazy start of the year. There's uh, a lot, uh, you know, unlike John, we're um, really ramping up and a lot of energy going on uh, 10G or uh, FDX, as you might want to um, otherwise known as, uh, very exciting. Um, about 50% of my time this year is dedicated to uh, to 10G or FDX, so that's um, going to be a big one for me. And, of course, P&M and all things proactive network maintenance and Cable Labs and SCTE and Comcast and all of that. So thanks again for having me. Great to have you, Larry. And and P and M. Uh, you know, speaking of P and M, we have Mister P and M from Cable Labs, Principal uh, Jason Roop, Principal Architect Architect Wired R and D at Cable Labs. So Jason, good to have you with us. How are you doing? I'm doing great. Thanks for having me. Looking forward to uh, this this hour. It's going to be a lot of fun. Absolutely. So um, today's topic is uh, is going to be a little bit about PNM. So we're excited about this latest issue of Broadband Library Magazine. It's the the whole PNM roadmap. It was full of PNM um, related topics, of which uh, Jason and Larry both contributed, as well as myself and a whole bunch of other author- authors. I'd love to have everyone on here, but uh, it would have been a rather crowded um, uh, roundtable. So uh, the point of today's topic is just to talk all about PNM and different things that were going on, as well as uh, a couple of the authors that are here go over their topics because this is, you know, really, I think the year that PNM is just absolutely coming into its, its, its maturity. Everyone's talking about it. And we had a lot of great articles on that. Um, you know, speaking of that, uh, so this, if you've not seen it, everyone, this is, this is the, uh, uh, online broadband magazine that you, you can read online if you didn't get your hard copy. Uh, of course, you can see Larry Wilcott's uh, face right on uh, right on the top there. And uh, again, the, almost every issue in this article of Broadband Library is covering some aspect of proactive network maintenance, or PNM. So definitely go online, www.broadbandlibrary.com, and you can get more information on that. Um, so that's that's basically uh, the what we're going to be focusing on initially. Um, what I'd like to do is is start off with um, you know maybe Larry and and uh, see Larry if you have any initial initial intros on on your on your article because your article was kind of the header. You had two articles in there, one interview and and one uh, one major article that you contributed your piece, and you've spearheaded a lot with P and M. You've done a lot of leading. Leader, leadership and driving in the PNM space uh, within your organization. So I thought maybe you could just take a, a couple minutes and give an overview of what your topics were uh, sure, in the Broadband yeah. Library. You bet. Thanks, Brady. So um, I talked a lot about um, it's kind of a, the roadmap for 2019, which is pretty appropriate for our conversation. Uh, at Comcast, uh, we've got a bunch of big opportunities. We're very excited <clears throat> about the... Um, Using our Doxis 3.1 PNM uh, to uh, uh, activate our PMA, for example, PMA is um, is uh, 
um, profile management application that gives us the ability to um, to dynamically assign um, service profile uh, to different um, users depending on the the fidelity of their channel or their communications link. So, you know, right now we're um, mostly running um, statically configured um, modulation profiles, and um, once we enable the uh, the PMA, we're going to be able to really unleash a lot of pent up um, capabilities in terms of capacity and reliability for customers. So that's really exciting. We can, you know, on a really significant um, portion of our network, we can up throttle our customers from 256 QAM to 1024 and even some cases uh, 4K QAM, which is um, crazy but true. <clears throat> so that's a big one. We're very excited about PMA and, um, you know, um, fully operationalizing the the PNM stack that we all worked hard to get into Doxis 3.1 from the beginning. You know, um, it always takes a little bit of time for the PNM to catch up, but it was baked in from the beginning, like we talked about. Um, but I think from um, day one, we're really going to be focusing on um, the RX MER per subcarrier. Uh, I'm pretty excited about uh, channel estimates and um, you know a few other things we're going to be focusing on right away. In particular, because we've, we're finding them very useful for um, for FDX or 10G um, modeling that we have to do to get it right uh, for interference groups and things like that. So there's a, a whole lot coming, um, and the side effect is is really um, all about. Uh, uh, more reliable networks for customers and in increasing bandwidth. So. Yeah, so you touched on RxMER and, and some of the new tests in uh, DOCSIS 3.1. Can you tell us a little bit about what RxMER is for those who may not have seen that yet? <clears throat> I know. It, it, well, if you've been doing this for 20 years, um, how could you think MER is exciting because <laughs> it's the same <laughs> thing we've been doing? Um, but it's per subcarrier. And the difference between um, DOCSIS 3.0 and 3.1 is 3.0 um, MER is measured within a six mega, at least depending on your um, your annex, six or eight megahertz wide um, uh, channel, and that's important because it tells you the performance of the channel. Um, but if you think about per subcarrier MER, you have you know uh, 50 or depending on what your setup is here at Comcast, it's 50 kilohertz resolution. Um, spacing on the uh, subcarriers, so that's really, really a high-resolution picture of the performance of the channel. Not the channel as a whole, but um, if you think about each subcarrier as its own channel, um, we can now, at 50 kilohertz resolution, we can now see the character of the interference, which tells us about what the interference is, and a lot of times we can figure out why, where, and when it's getting in, because we know a lot more about the type of interference. So that's really exciting. Um, and the other reason I'm excited about RxMER per subcarrier is it gives us a much better picture um, um, than the kind of the blurred picture of the six megahertz, um, you know, quantized uh, MER uh, of the channel characteristic, which is very important for FDX and or 10G. Sure. So, sure. so um, Jason, maybe I can ask you, like, uh, where, where do you see some of these measurements taking us in the future, such as ME, receive MER? What, what's, what's Cable Labs doing uh, with these types of measurements? Uh, yeah, we're doing a whole lot of things, and I see these as uh, very important for, for every operator out there, actually. Uh, you know, most of the, most of the, the issues that, uh, that a customer is going to have with uh, their Internet is going to be with that local loop simply because that's where there's a big exposure and uh, that's mostly a physical layer problem so no matter how much attention you want to give to the higher layers the physical layers got is going to be relevant forever and uh, having those capabilities uh, you know having them solid having them well understood having everyone used to using them I think is very important so we're developing a whole lot of things that support that of course, uh, you know we. If you've been working in the um, in, in the PNM space for a, for a while, um, then you've probably been working in it longer than I have. And what we've been doing in the last uh, little more than a year and a half now that I've uh, joined Cable Labs is uh, sort of building up the database. Uh, it's a it's a a base code of data collection we call our combined common collection framework, and we've got that in the hands of about eight to twelve operators, from what we can tell. Uh, and I say what we can, we can tell is because, you know, operators have access to it. They can download and run with it and do their own sort of thing. But uh, 
Uh, so well, we don't really know how many of them are out there using it, but from what I can tell, about eight or 12 operators and various people in, in, within those are starting to do data collection. And the reason that they would use XCCF is because it's probably their first uh, their first foray into doing data collection with, with uh, a, a purpose around either PMA or PNM or grid metrics or, or something like that, whereas they, they're trying something new with the data, which is great. Uh, so having more operators accessing and looking at PNM data is, uh, is all the better. Uh, that helps us to get uh, more of it out there. You know, as Larry said, uh, it's, you know, while some of these measurements have been out there a while, PNM is really kind of new to the industry. And there's a lot of operators out there that are just now getting into the 3.1 world. And 3.1 is where those advantages are really ubiquitous and you can take strong advantage of them. So uh, seeing operators adopt that is, is really a great thing. And uh, to help them out, we built this thing called CMVA, the Cable Modem Validation App. We use it here to validate modems for ATP and certification, but we handed it to chip vendors and modem vendors, and they actually are using it, and, and they could see right away that while, you know, there's modems out there that are supposed to be 3.1 capable, they don't always report reliably. So a lot of those uh, modem vendors took that to heart and used uh, CMVA and the XCCF as kind of a test bed and would uh, would work on improvements there. And we've seen improvement, uh, seen real improvement, which is nice, which means that uh, there should be more data available and it should be more reliably available, which uh, means you can uh, do a lot more with it. Okay, so let, let me things. just inter interrupt you because you, you, you explained the initialism CMV uh, the, the CMVE, uh, that CMVA, CMVA? Cable Modem Validation yeah. Application. But then you also threw out another initialism, XCCF, but mm -hmm. uh, you didn't explain what that initialism oh. is. And, and I also want to point out, because I know, you know just in case Ron Rannick is watching this, I am using yeah. initialism correctly, I, I hope. <laughs> and, and John will keep me honest on that one. So what is XCCF? Tell us about that's, that. Yes, that's our combined common collection framework. It started with uh, DCCF, DOCSIS Common Collection Framework. And uh, one afternoon, we actually brought it over to Larry's shop, plugged it in, and and got it working on some optical equipment inside of an afternoon. And we said, hey, you know, if we build this architecture a little bit different, we can have it do a whole lot of things. So we basically rebuilt it so that it's uh, it's more modular and can be turned into just about anything. So we've used it for optical. We're going to do a whole lot of things with optical uh, in the in the near future. Actually, the rest of this year is going to be a big push on optical. And uh, we've used it for power modems. So we're collecting power data uh, off the grid, which is great because power companies can then use the same collector for understanding how their network is performing using the cable network as an out-of-band network. So you can use the cable network to collect power data and provide it to power companies so that they have an out-of-band view of how their network's performing, meaning that if it's failed, they can understand where and help isolate it, and they know when there's uh, when there's a problem out there, which means it can become a safety issue as well. So XCCF is just a very general machine data collection platform, and we worked real hard to make it uh, very flexible so it can collect uh, uh, quickly, um, rapidly. It can collect uh, massive amounts when needed. It's got uh, approaches that allow you to scale to any operation size as well. So uh, it's out there for operators to use and we love to see operators take advantage of it and vendors too because, you know, vendors are our access to operators in a sustainable way. So, you know, we hand it to vendors and vendors can use it and uh, and incorporate it, any of these elements. And we're working on a whole lot of other things, too, that we want everyone else to incorporate it all off that base. So lots coming. All right. Thanks. Okay. John, so, you know, we've been talking about RF impairments here and, and using PNM to identify them. just want to get your take on that because we don't see many RF impairments uh, in a field on a regular basis, right? <laughs> John? Uh-oh. <laughs> Are you there, John? No, he's we, impaired. We see yeah, we, he's impaired. <laughs> you got no audio, man. Okay, well, thanks, John, for your input on that. We'll come back to you later. 
<laughs> let me let me let me jump back to Larry and uh, uh, Larry. What what are your thoughts on that? On on you know RF impairments in the field. Well, there's no shortage of them, and uh, I I say um, you know thank God for Doxis. It's really um, the, Doxis 3.0 and 3.1 have uh, changed the game. And we're, we're a lot of our metrics and telemetry, and you, you'll hear people talk about, well, what's new? You guys have been doing the same thing for 20 years with your MER and your code words and stuff. It's really not true. The whole, the fundamental operation of DOCSIS with channel bonding and its resiliency is, is unbelievable. My, my service at home, I have RF impairments um, inside and outside, and um, I, I have perfect service at home. I, um, I'm getting 150 megabits all day long without a hiccup, and I've got little ones streaming stuff and playing video games, and we're watching TV and iPad, this and that, and it's a great experience. And so um, th we've had occasion where we may want to call or need to call Comcast, um, but it's not about the RF performance. <laughs> you know, most people don't call and say, hey, my RF is bad. Um, they say my experience <laughs> is bad. But yeah. the problem is, you know, the measure that we have of the phi layer, you know, um, it's, there's a bunch of red in my house and I, and we are a proactive company now. And we're really getting great and they want to roll a truck to my house, you know, that, which is fantastic, but it's not necessary or going to necessarily improve my already fantastic experience. So we're working hard on those opportunities. Um, just because the intersection of RF problems and the intersection with customers calling um, the operators um, is, you know, not insignificant, but they're not cause, uh, causal. They're not related, at least in my experience. I mean, there are, my, in my house, there are lots of times when they are, um, but we're trying to, you know, have a disambiguation of those, you know, two different things that to a lot of people might seem causal. So. Yep, absolutely. Um, Jason, your thoughts? Yeah, uh, so Doxis is highly resilient as a technology, which which just makes it extremely powerful. It's it's why we're able to use it to to gain reliable access to the internet so much. Uh, but because of how resilient it is, it gets around issues in the in the physical layer and and even in other areas. Uh, it's because of that resiliency, it works around problems. And what that means is that for you to really use Doxis right and well, you got to have proactive network maintenance in some form that helps you to identify those issues because they are going to be there and Doxis will work around them. And if you identify them, you can solve them before they get worse because they will get worse if untreated. They're like uh, you know a, a small problem that, that you might have. Let's say you've got a little bit of a sniffle and well, if you don't take care of it, it's going to become uh, an all-out fever and a cold, and you're going to be out of work for a while. And you know that's it's the same idea. Doxis is a complicated system, and uh, so you need uh, the complementary aspects of it to monitor it and to address those issues before they become serious and before the service is out. Yes, well said, Jason. Um, I point not lost is that's really the whole secret sauce about proactive network maintenance is because of the goodness of Doxis, we can now. Um, see these problems before they affect the customer, and we have the opportunity to get ahead of them, find them, and fix them before before they break, and the customer feels it. So, um, yeah, and that, uh, I that's a, a perfect compliment to uh, to my statement. Thank you. Thank you. Hey, yeah. Uh, can you hear me? Okay. Hey, we can. John, welcome back. Glad, glad to have you here. <laughs> yeah, I uh, had to redial in. Uh, the beauty of living out in the middle of nowhere. Hey, so. <laughs> You know, just listening through, I have a few things. Um, I guess one of the things that Larry brought up was, you know, PNM and full bandwidth capture, downstream MER readings, RX MER, uh, on a subcarrier basis. From Cisco's point of view, Jason Miller and I have been promoting 25 kilohertz subcarrier spacing just for better efficiency. Uh, and it, it, because everything's done sort of in hardware, it's not like it's driving up your CPU to do 8,000 subcarriers versus 4,000 subcarriers. So the 25 kilohertz subcarrier has been what we've been promoting for more speed. Um, I also like to point out that it's not like we're getting the data burst MER readings. They're getting data burst MER or they're getting MER readings from the pilots that are rolling through those frequencies. So you have those scattered pilots moving through. Uh, I And as a word of caution, I had some earlier firmware that used to report the pilot MER incorrectly, meaning it's supposed to subtract 6 dB, 
because the pilots are running 6 dB higher than your data carriers. Mm -hmm. So I had some inflated MER readings that were too good to be true, which means they're too good to be true, uh, <laughs> which, made me which made me question them, right? Um, but now, you know, uh, a lot of that firmware has been updated and they're subtracting the 6 dB from the pilot MER to give a equivalent data burst or data MER, which is good. Uh, so that's one good thing. And I agree, you know, more visibility because we have finer granularity in those reportings. Uh, so that's a good thing. And in the regard to PMA, the pro predictive, proactive, proactive modulation assignment. Profile sure. management. Profile management. What's the A stand for? Application, usually. Uh, <laughs> Larry, what are you calling it? A profile management application. Okay. All right. So with that said, I think where that would come in, because we're looking at too with machine learning. Uh, I don't know about, you know, artificial intelligence besides my own artificial intelligence. Um, <laughs> the, the, and and the that's debatable. Let's say. <laughs> yes, <laughs> it's intelligence is artificial. No. <laughs> it's very artificial. <laughs> so, so I think it becomes more valuable when we get modems in the market that actually support 8K and 16K Guam. I have modems in the market today. Obviously, all the three one modems in the market today only support up to 4K QAM. Um, and I have a lot of modems that will do 4K QAM in today's markets and analog fiber. We go to digital fiber, we have even better response. Uh, if we go, I even have Node Plus 3 and modems doing 4K QAM. You know, granted, I will have some offsets to the default thresholds when that profile supposedly breaks. So there are some ways to best practices and get better speed. But I think to assign individual modulation for you know, different parts of spectrum for individual modems, I just think it becomes more powerful when we can start actually assigning 8K QAM or 16K QAM. I know it's a pipe dream, but it is what it is, and I think it would actually work just from what some of the numbers I've been seeing. Uh, if we get remote phi deeper and deeper, obviously, and less coax. Um, the other one was... Um, um, uh, there was like four or five things. I should have took notes. <laughs> It'll come to me later, but that's sort of the things I've been thinking about. Uh, Larry was uh, on this profile management application, how more efficient or effective I could make it if I have end devices that could do more. Like right now they're, they're not there, right? I mean, what you buy is uh, modems that support up to 4K QAM, 2.0 of DM blocks, and that's it. And maybe 2.0 of DMA blocks in the upstream. And I wanted to ask you, if uh, you guys are doing any DOCSIS 3.1 upstream yet on the Comcast side. Okay, so um, number one, I, I agree. Um, I think uh, the opportunities there, I, I think you've been staring at an extra 6 dB uh, for too long that you started to believe it. Um, but, uh, <laughs> uh, um, no, but I think um, in, in uh, you know, future um, revs of our hardware, we'll be able to support higher um, modulation orders for sure. Um, I, I totally agree with that. Now, today it's not holding us back. I'll say today the software is holding us back. Our ability to to, to fully unleash 1K and 4K uh, modulation profiles where they are um, capable of running it, boy, that's a huge win for our customers. So um, I agree with you. Um, and number two, um, yes, uh, but in very small trials where uh, there are people here at Comcast 100% um, focused on, uh, on OFDMA upstream. Very nice. Oh, right. I remember my th my fourth fourth topic was you mentioned about the MER readings giving you visibility into MER and binary granularity on the subcarrier basis. Uh, from Jason Miller and Jeff Riddell, my internal Cisco, our testing, we found that because of t we believe because of FFT and time and frequency interleaving, that if you have a narrow MER area, that's bad. Eventually, when you reach a certain point, like about 25 dB MER, the rest of the subcarriers will start taking a hit in their MER. So even though there's no ingress under that other part of the spectrum, the other ones will also start taking a hit. So I would ask you to keep an eye on that. So you might say, wow, why is my MER bad across the board? And it could be because the MER is so bad at a, sp uh, a small uh, located spot in your spectrum. So Interesting. Keep, an eye, keep your eye on that and see what you yeah, think. All right. So I'd like to uh, 
uh, move to Jason for a second and, and Jason ask you about um, profile management, uh, which is something that John brought up. And if you could just give us a little background on, on PMA, which I know is something that Cable Apps uh, has working on, just to, you know, tell us a little bit about that and, and what it can do. Because uh, it does tie into PNM very well. I know you have to have the PNM metrics in order to make PMA decisions. Uh, can you, can you al- enlighten us a little on that? Uh, sure, a little bit. I mean, uh, the idea there is really just that uh, you're kind of leaving bandwidth on the table if you're using a less than optimal profile for a modem. So a modem is going to have uh, certain capabilities based on uh, its physical layer properties between it and the CMTS. And those physical issues uh, can mean certain frequencies perform better than others. And if you can assign a profile for a modem to tell it to send at certain rates and certain frequency bands that can uh, take full use of the capabilities of the, those frequencies and what's between it and the CMTS, then you get more capacity. So that means that if, you, if the CMTS can have multiple profiles and a richer set of profiles could certainly be better, then you can assign uh, better profiles to those modems and take full advantage of what their capabilities are. And then everybody gets the full amount of, of uh, bandwidth that they can take advantage of, which, you know, of course, means everybody has better service. Uh, so having profile assignment, uh, you know, us- per- usually done off of, off of with a, a separate server that does analysis of the data and then from that prescribes uh, what the right profile is for those modems, that's... Uh, that's really a nice advantage if you if you can do that. Uh, not everyone is ready to go there. Not everyone has uh, uh, you know the support systems in place to make that go fast. But I think you're going to want uh, in in a Doxis three one world you're going to want that advantage because you're going to take better advantage of the bandwidth that's there. And you're going to serve customers much better. It's going to make uh, the Doxis that you uh, that you're using even more robust. Sure. Yeah, and um, that little touch on that is um, an, another good use case is, for example, if you're running, uh, you're in an area where you can support 1K or 4K QAM modulation profile, and then you have a spurious interference um, that wasn't there when you assigned the profile. Now you can downshift that that subscriber to, say, 256 QAM so that at least their experience is reliable, although um, you know you may be... Uh, limiting some of the uh, the capacity that they have. So, yep. I, I, I think spurious is a bad word. <laughs> that makes it sound like impulse noise, and obviously, yeah, yeah, the modulation no, isn't going to do good, right? You're talking no, about steady enough. state yeah, ingress, right? right. Well, uh, no. For example, um, uh, LTE interference, where your yeah. uplink is really, really strong, and if you happen to be, uh, if you have a loose connector on on your modem, is a great example. And for the for the uh, the duration of your phone call. If you could uh, basically downshift that profile for the 10 minutes that you know somebody's talking on the phone, and then once it frees up, it could upshift again. Yep. That's a, a use case. And you're right, spurious is not a great example because we're used to that meaning something very specific. Yeah, Plus, yeah. we have the technology that allows us to identify those LTE ingress issues and uh, then do things about it. So Sure, yeah, you notify the customer. That, yeah. uh, say, you probably got a loose connector. We saw your yep. phone call interfere yep. with your service. And I've so, witnessed so how, how good you guys are at doing that. It works. How, how do you identify LTE if it's hidden underneath your DOCSIS 3.1 signal? Mm-hmm. Well, that's, <laughs> that's your <laughs> RxMER per yep. area, all the fun. Right. Yeah. I assume that you just did based on the MER reading? Well, no, actually, if you invert it, you can you can signature match an LTE uh, carrier uh, really easily. Yeah. If you if you invert the MER graph, that's is that right. what you're saying? Yes. Yeah, that's what I figured. Okay. And you can yeah. see it readily in a full band capture as well. It's it's pretty obvious when you see them. That is, if it's um, if it's above the carrier. The yes. problem with full band capture yeah. is you don't have the um, uh, it's just a spectrum an, analyzer. It doesn't do any right. good for stuff underneath of the, the state yeah. state carrier. Unless it's yeah. really, really bad and it's yeah. added to, 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 to the I mean, they have to be the same size just to add 3 dB, right? That's yeah. right. Well, I, and <laughs> I've seen them. They can be that bad. That's the thing. It doesn't oh, take yeah. much. Yeah, especially with the, the handheld device right next to your modem. Yes. Yeah, the field strength good. generated by, a, by an uplink of uh, a mobile transmitter is remarkable. Yeah. But by, by the way, 5G, what uh, 
is what frequencies, does anyone know what frequencies the 5G is going to use? I mean, 4G LTE is between, say, 700 and 800 megahertz, but what is 5G at? Do we know? Uh, you guys know? Yeah, so there is, um, it's in a 6 megahertz to 6 gigahertz range, so there's a lot of room in there. Um, you know, I'm not sure. I haven't been watching, uh, you know, frequency maps and who's playing on doing what, but it's all um, for a large part of it, right? Um, you know, it could potentially interfere. For sure, 4G LTE is smack dab in the middle of our uh, yeah, yeah. FTM. Yep. Yep. Yeah, so it's uh, we got problems today that we need to address. And I think what we solve today will solve for the future with 5G as well. Yes. Well stated. Okay, very good. A nice conversation, guys. I do want to play a little devil's advocate on PNL. Oh, no. Yes. Yeah, so, uh, um, and we have some good questions that come in from people. This first one is, I get the idea behind PNM. My thoughts are the cable industry needs to think much more about the layers above the physical layer, layer four and above, for example. The idea is that being sold here is that physical layer issues, when fixed, means everything else above the above that, like the customer experience, is going to be good. We don't provide, encourage, promote tools that show packet loss, increased latency, buffering video because the definitely is a customer impacting. So the, you know, the intent from the qu customer here is, or this question from the listener here is that, uh, you know, they're concerned that PNM is not just looking high enough in the, in the stack. So I, I kind of want to get your feedback on here. Are we not doing enough with PNM? Is it not looking in the issues that are truly affecting the, the end customer? So I'll throw that out first to you, Larry. Uh, well, <laughs> thanks, Brady. I love being the first to answer questions on your show. That's a, there's a lot to unpack there, and I'll say, um, and it's uh, yeah. um, it's true in some regards. But um, so, P and M is the 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 stated uh, the statement there wasn't totally correct. P and M is the idea that we can find and fix problems before they impact our customers. That's before we lost packets, right? Um, now, um, if you have 10 PNM visible problems, which one do you work first? Or a thousand or a hundred thousand problems? Well, you want to probably start with the ones that are dropping packets the most. And I'll say we at Comcast, we are actually uh, doing um, that kind of work as prior, part of our prioritization. Um, but that's um, that's larger than PNM itself. And um, I'm not trying to oversimplify the problem, but for sure, when you're dropping packets, you're too late. And the, the point about PNM is getting ahead of it before packets fall. And uh, my house is a perfect example. My house fails um, a lot of uh, by tests in uh, Mocha and RF, upstream, downstream. We've got all kinds of stuff going on. I'll spare you the details about why. But, um, you know, I have 150 megabit service. I could have more, but that's pretty good for my family. And I don't, I've never experienced a single problem in my house. We love our service. Love it. Um, and so um, that's a good example of why um, knowing that I have a problem and being able to prioritize it with people who are dropping a bunch of packets make a huge difference. So I totally give credit um, to that question. That, um, but the art of PNM is before the problems. So that's my comment. Yeah. Jason, your thoughts on that? Yeah. Uh, so PNM definitely is a significant part of the puzzle. Uh, it's not the whole thing, but it is uh, probably one of the more important for the cable industry, uh, simply because uh, it addresses, uh, you know, mostly the physical issues, which are usually related to where you have to roll a truck, where you have to uh, do something that's uh, that's going to take you some time and energy and expense. Uh, higher level issues are usually at uh, node locations because that's where the active components are, that's where the higher level uh, work is done, and a lot of those will have technicians on them uh, and they're readily accessible unless, of course, they're in the home. Uh, so looking at this from a service availability and service reliability perspective, uh, there are multiple issues and th that person who asked those questions is very insightful and they're, they're right on correct that, yeah, there are other issues and they deserve some attention. But, uh, PNM being proactive is uh, is the other half of DOCSIS from my perspective, and we're talking about DOCSIS technology, so it gets a lot of uh, attention, and it should, uh, but it isn't everything. Um, 
it, it needs to be part of the larger puzzle of uh, making sure that services are highly available and reliable. Yeah. I, you know, I, I take this question as being, what are we doing as an industry, not what PM is doing? PM is meant for DOCSIS. DOCSIS is layer one, two, three, right? It's physical layer. And obviously, you troubleshoot, you're going to start at the lowest layer first, layer one, the physical layer. Um, when you start looking at DOCSIS or layer four and five, I would argue that Cable Labs is looking at that. They just had a presentation just yeah. a couple of weeks ago on low latency DOCSIS. So, I mean, we are looking at uh, ways to specify traffic and put them in different queues and have uh, lower latency or applications that are, uh, what would you call it, uh, susceptible to latency or jitter concerns yep. like gaming, uh, mobile backhaul over a DOCSIS network. It might be something we want to offer in the future for 5G and do a mobile backhaul through our DOCSIS network. So, I mean, those applications are going to be very sensitive and there are ways for us to address that. So, yeah. I mean, we do have, we are looking at it, right? Yep, I think the yeah. industry definitely is. John, um, that was really a, a really elegant way to say it, that, um, that P&M is DOCSIS specific, and that's true. Mm -hmm. But don't forget that, that the M is maintenance, and those are people driving around trucks and that are working on things that are not just DOCSIS. It's physical environment things. But I totally agree with you. I, th I think um, the domain of P&M is very specific to DOCSIS but it's an integral part of larger systems and processes. Um, and so, for example, at Comcast, uh, um, we do have um, much bigger systems that string together DOCSIS, uh, you know, layer one, two, three, up with higher layer, um, you know, performance monitoring to end-to-end -to -end yep. customer experience. Yep. It is not, but p and is a part of that, but it isn't that. Yep. 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 Well, yeah, so, I, I brings up, that brings up a good point, Larry. Uh, a while back, a few years back, I was on a panel a workshop for STT Expo and a guy from Switzerland or Sweden, uh, they were looking at ways to do quality of experience. And I'm, I'm curious to know if you guys do this. He mentioned the newer modems have a built-in FTP server. So they were basically doing speed tests remotely. So you wouldn't have to go through the, through the modem to their, you know, the CPE at a customer's house. You basically went to the modem itself, uh, almost like a Raspberry Pi or whatever was built into the modem. So they would basically uh, do a speed test and they could kind of, get an idea of quality of experience before the customer complained. Yeah, that's a great point. Uh, we, we are definitely doing a large scale speed test um, work here. It's a, uh, it's really hard to, because of the bandwidth um, you're consuming to do speed tests. Um, it's a, uh, you know, when you have 40 plus million endpoints out there, I'll try to push a gig. <laughs> it's, I mean, that's not really what it is, but um, think about the scale of that. And so um, short answer is yes, we are definitely looking at, and, and that's a great proxy to customer experience, but then it also, it doesn't take into account like late, latency and jitter and, um, you know, so it's really a, a much bigger conversation than even speed test. But yeah, great point. You, it, that's a good, a very good uh, proxy to what a customer would feel. All right. So this next one really ties into a little bit into the previous question, but I think it's important that we we discuss it and and understand it. Uh, so this this listener said, you know, P and M is being seen or touted by some in the industry as the silver bullet to identify all those ills that we have. And and I, I you know I've seen this before, and I, I've, I've I've heard it before, I've talked about it before, and I I want to throw this this one to Jason first. Um, because I think it's it's important we do level set it that you know P and M is not necessarily a silver bullet. It does a lot of great things, but we have to be cautious and careful in how we promote it in the industry to to customers, etc. So, Jason, your feedback and thoughts on that for as silver bullets? Sure. Well, um, if 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 the definition is you can only have one silver bullet, then that's not it. But uh, you know, a gun holds more than one bullet. Maybe we have several silver bullets. I don't know, but uh, it, it's certainly an element of the larger uh, solution set. And it's not the panacea, and it doesn't solve all problems. But uh, but it's necessary. It really is. Like like we keep saying today, that it's kind of the the complementary, necessary other half of Doxis. Doxis uh, opens up a separation between impairments and impact on service. And once you open up that separation, you got to have something that takes care of it. And that's what PNM is about. And so much of it is physical layer because so much of what we provide in a network service is a physical layer issue. So, uh, and it's very, uh, and it's very much about being proactive, meaning solve the problem before the customer is feeling that pain. 
Uh, so, you know, it may not be a silver bullet, but it's an important uh, it's an important aspect. And so, uh, everyone ought to be doing some semblance of it, some uh, some elements of it. Uh, it's like, why wouldn't you, right? Yeah. Why wouldn't yeah. you? And and isn't it free? I mean, it's. You need the expertise to be able to write the code and do the, the graphic side of it. And Larry's is taking that to the next level, but yeah. uh, there's smaller systems that don't have that expertise. So they might hire say Brady and his nimble this, or That's right. they, they might do their own small toned down version. Yep. And we here at cable labs are, are trying to prime that pump a little bit too, by building up some, some basic capabilities, you know, like, uh, uh, where we're going soon with what I'm calling our table stakes app, which by the way, uh, you two, uh, Larry and Brady were the reason it got named table stakes app because we did this round table. If you'll remember it, uh, the last summer conference. And I think Larry was the first to make reference to certain things being table stakes. And I just said, you know, that's a great name, uh, for a first application. So we're building something here that I think will be that, uh, that pump priming. So anybody who isn't taking full advantage of PNM, um, we're going to build them something that shows them the value and the benefit of it and gives them something to start with. And so that then, you know, they can understand that and then they can make a decision where to go next, which is, you know, usually getting the right tools and the right support so that they can have a full on program about it. But I think a lot of operators have problems getting over that first hurdle. So we want to help them get over that first hurdle. Yeah, so I think, it's I think that's like a really a good point. It, it's a challenge for some some folks to understand the, what the value is to get over the hurdle and say, you know, should we even go down this route and and get into P and M because they they do have some of the challenges to say, well, you know, wh why should I invest in something that's just looking at the physical layer? Because some of these other questions I said, you know, why don't we need to look at all layers? You know, layers one through seven. And that is the challenge. I like what you're doing with the table stakes to say, you know, here's kind of something we can look at and see what the benefits are, what the initial yeah. values are. Yeah. So, um, you know, I Larry, can't, that's... I can't, go, go ahead, can't wait to. I can't wait to see what the translation is for Japanese and uh, Latin America. <laughs> <laughs> table <laughs> we, stakes. We use, well, yeah, we use these type of analogies or metaphors, and, and yeah. they don't translate very well sometimes. Yeah, well, the, the German translation could be quite interesting too. <laughs> I, I, I'll, I'll tell you though, we have uh, our our table stakes app is being built within it, an environment, our PNM application environment, which we call PNM and E for short, and &E. uh, which, which sounds like CNM and E, right? So uh, <laughs> when I was explaining this to our Japanese uh, uh, partners out, out in Japan. Uh, I, I put up PNM and, and and made the statement, and I got enough chuckles where I knew that that it plays. So even <laughs> in Japan, some of these puns will play. They, they probably thought you were talking about M and M. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I showed them a picture of a CM and a, a C and M and E after I said it, though, and so that that really brought it home. So they got it. Okay. <laughs> By the way, I really think the silver bullet analogy is not very good. The silver bullet is what you kill something with, a werewolf. I think the analogy I think the analogy should have been more like P and M is not the holy grail of, you know, Well now you're in the Raiders of Lost Ark. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> but you're, you're also it's a, a different light. Yeah. <laughs> Oh yeah, you guys, P and M is not a silver bullet. It's uh in fact it might um, get you to the silver bullet faster though. Yeah, things sometimes though things actually get harder before they get easier. And you'll see yeah. this a lot is people say, Well, I want to get. I want to reduce my truck or my my trouble calls and and overall truck rolls and and um, I remember when we started this at Comcast to come. I was Larry. We're way too busy answering phone calls, going putting out fires to deal with this proactive stuff. And I thought to myself, okay, here's an opportunity. And here we are. It's a long game, you guys. We've been at this for ten years. I'll tell you, our combined call-in rate is well over halved since we started this. Yeah. And by the way, you aren't going to half your call-in rate. Um, any other way? Any other way? That's There's right. no silver bullet, meaning it's not going to happen right. quickly, and it's not going to happen instantaneous, and you're not going to just put money down in a transaction and get calls yeah. uh, reduced. It's a process, and it requires operational investment, executive investment, uh, care investment. It's a it's a it's a culture shift in companies, and so. so um, 
Larry, right. I think that is an incredibly important statement that you just made because we see this so many times. We we put a PM system in an operator's environment, and you know, depending on how good or how bad that environment is, suddenly they see this massive amount of red modems that we're identifying. They're not red modems because they're offline, they're red modems because they have impairments in them. And now suddenly they're saying, Oh geez what do we do with, with all these red modems? So it actually, when initially, it can generate more work for the operator because they, they're now seeing correlation groups. They're seeing that they have damaged cable, uh, you know, co corrosion in their plant that are creating these correlation groups. Plus, you have lots of home impairment issues that, you know, we know those homes are impaired. Their, their modems are, are, having, are working hard. Their pre-equalizer is working hard. And we say, okay, you know, what's the process here? Well, you, you fix your outside plan issues. You start working on the worst in-home issues because these, these, these in-home issues are likely leaking return path noise into your, into your return, which they're, they're already battling that today to begin with. So suddenly you've given them more work on top of the existing work that they're doing. And, and that's not really what they had expected. Well, I, I, I think it's important to look at it another way. You, you don't have more work. You just have visibility to the work that was coming. Yes. Because all <laughs> those things are going to turn into problems later. They're, they're going to be offline modems. <laughs> yes. It, it's an opportunity because if you're going to roll a truck out there because a customer called, here's three other things you can take care of while you're out there. So Solve you don't go back. Too. Yeah, you don't go back. And so think of it as rolling one truck to avoid four truck rolls. It, yeah. It's it's just an opportunity, and it's a, and it's a smart one if you're pinching pennies. And we, we so, can do it much more intelligently because when we go to fix that problem, maybe it's an outage, maybe yeah. it's an intermittent modem flapping off and on. Mm -hmm. Now when we go there, we have a lot more visibility into why that modem is flapping off and on. And that customer has been That's calling right. us for the last two months saying, you know, I've been having right. issues with this modem. Now we're going there much more informed about yep. the issue that we're going to fix. That's right. And so you have just saying, oh, I'm just going to replace that modem. It, that modem didn't need to be replaced. That's right. That's so, right. Yeah. You'll fix it faster. You'll fix more problems with one with one event. And uh, you're going to save money on all sides doing that. Yeah. Uh, the, the really important thing that Larry mentioned, though, is the operational change. And it has to be it has to be throughout the organization all the way from the top down. If you have just if you have someone in, in you know, in maybe a supervisor in the organization is saying, OK, I'm, I'm going to drive this. But it's just like kind of one guy trying to push it. He's really going to be hamstrung where we yeah. see the greatest success are in the organizations where you have someone at the very top driving it down through and everyone is on board. Everyone's buying into it. That's where the success really happens happens. And I, I think that's why, you know, in Comcast, they've had such great success because the whole organization appears to be on board. And, and I don't know, Larry, is that, is that true? Or is, am I, am I incorrect in, in saying that? No, no, it's been part of our culture for a long time. No, believe me, it wasn't, it didn't come easy. Um, we worked very hard at it. It's, um, we, uh, everywhere from, you know, training to having to spend more money on span replacements. Uh, it, you know, when you see a lot of broken cable, you got to fix them. And that costs money. And we, uh, but that's, that's an investment that you'll never regret in your life. So uh, we, uh, yes, yeah, short answer is yes. It's, but it's not, it doesn't happen overnight. Um, and it's a, it's a battle won in small pockets and it, it took a while, but um, after a couple of years, um, you know, people are all on board. It's just part of our culture now. Yep. Yeah. And that's, that's, that's why we got to this point where the, the SCTE magazine broadband library. We've got a bunch of articles because we're we've got such momentum right now, where so many operators are on board with this that we're we're actually seeing a lot of success. And I I know Larry, you've been you've been you've been preaching this for years, and I've been doing the same thing. So it's so exciting to see this this actually really getting all the momentum that it has. Oh yeah, I've seen evidence uh, from just even the short time I've been here. When I started, you know, we had the ingenious group that, uh, you know, we would have maybe uh, a single digit attendance in most of those calls. Now we're over, for most of them, we're in the 30s yeah. uh, in terms of attendance. And uh, we've got multiple operators represented, whereas sometimes it'd be one or maybe two operators on a good, on a good meeting. Now we've got sometimes four and more operators represented regularly and lots of vendors who are very, very active. Uh, vendors who really care to help operators take advantage of PNM, which is great. Yeah, and for those who don't know, who are who are watching or listening to the podcast, 
Um, Jason Roop leads the Ingenious PM Working Group uh, at Comcast, or I'm sorry, at Cable Labs, and does a fantastic job about it, with it. So, Jason, I just want to commend you on on all the hard work that you do uh, for the PM Working Group. That I, I think is it's expanding it. Uh, you mentioned um, PM for optics. So we we had one of the people. I'm watching the the questions come in here. We had one of the the people come in that said um, PM for five or two. That's awesome. So I mean, I think we're just going to see this continue to expand. We're doing PM yeah. for Wi-Fi. I don't know if you want to comment on anything else that we're doing oh, yeah. PM for, but uh, I think it's just it's exciting how it's continuing to expand and it's going to help the cable industry uh, over many years to come. Absolutely, yeah. Even the Wi-Fi stuff is fantastic too. Uh, I don't get to do much of that. I've got a counterpart over in the wireless group that does that, but I get to watch it from the side and just in awe because. Uh, that's going to help more than the cable industry. The entire Wi-Fi industry is going to be impacted by what they're doing there. The Wi-Fi Alliance is uh, building specifications that are coming out and going to be implemented, and you're going to be able to have a lot of issues that today we all live with in our homes are just going to go away because their capabilities are coming to that world. Their PNM capabilities and PNM is applying uh, there. Uh, fantastically. It's going to be a great use case for the concepts and it's going to bring great value to everyone. Yeah. And and then also for for those uh, watching or listening to podcasts, Larry, Larry Wilcott, you have probably been the biggest champion in the industry on PNM and have done the most at Comcast to really drive PNM. So I, I, I just want to thank you as well because so much of what I'm doing in the, in PNM uh, would not be possible with all the work that you're doing. So I, I just I want to commend you on that. And also you got the SCTE member of the year. I'm not sure how much of that was based on your PNM work or how much of that was done with your SCTE chapter work, but thank you also i want to commend uh, thanks, you on Brandon. all the hard work that you've uh, done but uh, let me uh, get a quick um uh a quick shameless plug-in for the sCTE network operations subcommittee number seven for pnm this is a place where we work on the operational aspects of pnm it's, we call it where art meets science and uh very closely partnered with jason we uh co-mingle um, on each other's working groups and, um, and the operations subcommittee number seven is a place where we do all of the operational practice documents and training materials and all this other stuff. Um, with the point being that we can take all these really often complex but important and valuable capabilities and technologies and getting them integrated and um, with uh, operators so that we can take advantage of them faster and, um, and share all the lessons learned um, at an industrial scale so that all cable ships can rise yep. in PNM. And the other thing I would like I agree with you. the signal and cancel the echo. <laughs> well said. <laughs> I agree with you. I, I want to get a comment in about uh, Jason. Um, a lot of folks don't know Jason's background, but he came in from uh, from the DSL um, in uh, in uh, wireline uh, communications, and uh, he's just hit the ground running and just become such a valuable asset for uh, for cable. And we're so lucky to have him, uh, Jason. We're really glad you're part of the team, and and thank you very much for for being here. Well, thank you, and, and thank you for welcoming me into it because, I mean, the only reason uh, we got such a fast start, at least I think it was a pretty fast start, was because when I got here, I had tons of people who were all trying to make things, great things happen, and I could see very quickly, all I got to do is help push, and, uh, and it's been great, and it's loads of fun, and we're making, I think, some great achievements as a community. Yep. And of course, uh, thanks, Brady and John. You guys are uh, oh yeah, um, uh, are my favorites. <laughs> 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 yeah, John, we, we lost your video, John. I thought I thought you were gone, but we got your audio still. So glad glad you're still on. <laughs> guess, guess what happened? I got a I got a downpour. My satellite internet connection went out. <laughs> there you go. We can we can look at your 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 phone call in then. So <laughs> that's a fine layer problem we can't fix. <laughs> I know, I know. We need to stop stop the rain. <laughs> well, I guess it's, at least it's not snow, John. So glad you're still there, John. You're always our rock, yeah. man. <laughs> so I, I do have a, a kind of a comment to what Jason was bringing up earlier about the resiliency of Doxus, and I, I would say yes with three one much more resilient than 3.0 and 2.0 with the yeah. uh, you know profile management with resilient bonding groups partial mode uh cm status messages you got all kinds of stuff right keeps right. the modem aligned i've had customers come to me cable mso's or cable companies 
and say, oh, well, John, we, you know, we, it's an old school mentality. We don't want to turn on all this stuff that masks or puts band-aids into our network because we want the customer to call in. So the RF guys will fix no. the place. <laughs> I'm like, oh my God. <laughs> no, I'm like, no, that's no, like no. The, the saying there is cutting off your nose to spite your face. I, you I know, want my customer you, to be aggravated. <laughs> <laughs> no, you guys, you know, nobody subscribes to that. And, uh, you know, I know, that attitude won't last long in this modern. Era. I know. Yeah. I know because well, with the level of uh, competition we have, the customer will just go somewhere else. Yeah, absolutely. Well, and we love our customers, man. We want them to have a great experience. Yeah. Of course. <laughs> It's become a very competitive environment, and I think the lifeline, we've talked about this before, the lifeline of data has, has become so critical for users that it's, it's like, if, when data goes out, people are like, what do we do? So <laughs> it's, it becomes very important to keep that data on. And I think that's why we're seeing P&M become so important. We want to fix those problems before the modem, before the modem goes off. Thing, ugly things happen in households when data goes down. <laughs> Yes, yes, I agree. And, uh, you know, even before the modem goes off, before you dropped a packet, and we were before the, the, the call started and we were doing our sound checks, we talked about the packet dropping in the woods and, uh, and nobody was there to hear it. Um, we, we really, really care a lot about uh, delivering. Um, it, that's what makes, that's a differentiator for, for cable is that we have really, really reliable and high performance service. Yep. Of things that people care about, internet, family, phone calls, all of that. Yeah, I think people are talking about like, well, will 5G replace Doxus and things like that? And just like John had happened to him, it started to rain. And what happened? His video went away. I think that's the difference between a wired versus a wireless connection. When the rain starts, uh, your wired connection will stay up when, and, and your wireless connection will become very sketchy. So I think that's going to be the competitive differentiation between people deciding whether or not they'll go to 5G as their provider or they'll stay with a wired connection. The wired connection is just so much more reliable. And That's keep right. in mind, 5G is not 5 giga, gigabits. It's it's not 5 a gig of, of capacity. Uh, you're you're going to have lots of use cases where you're going to need higher capacity. And Doxis is a constantly evolving technology, bringing higher and higher amounts of bandwidth and uh, so you're always going to have a certain amount of use case for it. Even if you think you can do some things with wireless, uh, you're not going to want to do everything with it. It's just going to be a far better experience with Doxis. Yeah, absolutely. All right, guys. I, I can't believe it. The hour went by so incredibly quickly. Um, I'll give any, if anyone wants to give a last plug in or a last word for you know where they're going to be traveling or presenting or anything like that. Please go ahead, um, Jason. Any any plugs you want to give yourself? Um, yeah, well, a few things going on here at Cable Labs just that I want people to be aware of. And if it excites you, come join the fun and help us out. Uh, you know, like we got Tom here, he's working on uh, standardizing at SCT some of his uh, non service interruption uh, TDR approaches. And he's got this now, this new low cost vector uh, network analyzer that, uh, that uses only the I channel and uh, doesn't need the queue in certain cases. And it works pretty slick. It's, and we're going to try and uh, make these things uh, highly reliable solutions. So R&D efforts continue there. The Ingenious Group is doing all sorts of really cool things. We're building a best practice document that's going to uh, help operators adopt and understand how to take full advantage of 3.1. Uh, we're also looking at uh, full duplex uh, mm -hmm. and how we can support that. And uh, we've got a new working group, uh, a new task force, rather, for flexible Mac architecture mm -hmm. and making sure that PNM is well defined for it as well. So um, we're covering the future. PNM is going to make sure everything is uh, reliable. And I'm looking forward to all these great things. Awesome. Great stuff. John, any plugs you want to give yourself? <laughs> uh, I don't think so. <laughs> um, <laughs> I don't want people to know where I'm at. <laughs> All right. <laughs> we, we can't even see you, man. It's You're hidden. <laughs> I'm going to go to the machine. All right. Hey, Larry, yourself? <laughs> No, no, we're all good. Um, everybody, thank you for uh, for participating, and uh, and we'll look forward to another episode with you, Brady. I'm looking yeah, forward to it. Thanks for inviting well. me. Yep, so thank glad to be a part of this party. It's it's fun. 
All right. Thank you all. Hey, um, so Larry, Jason, John, thank you so much for your time. Our next episode is episode 47, scheduled for April 26. It's on FDX and MacFi. So as always, you know, we, we do our best to give you good technical contact every month. If you like what you're watching, please do subscribe. Hit the thumbs up button on YouTube. Cat, uh, schedule us on your podcast, and we'll give you. We'll see you next month. Thanks all. Bye bye. Have a great weekend. Take care.